Well, that's, well, this is wonderful. So, um, okay, so um, welcome everybody to this uh, in our latest series uh, of interviews. And it's my absolute pleasure to be talking to David Noble Rollin uh, today um, to discuss his life, his career in natural history and with the society. So thank you, David, for, for agreeing um, to, to have a chat with me and uh, and welcome to this kind of virtual online series. Yes, well, it's a, a new experience to be interviewed this way for me. So we'll see how it goes. <laughs> yes, <laughs> hopefully it will be enjoyable. Um, so um, I wonder if we can start at the beginning, if we may, mm -hmm. and, and if I could ask you, when you first started getting interested in natural history and, and what it was or who it was that helped you get into this world? Well, this is going to really throw things. I was born into it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> My father was an ornithologist um, and uh, I, I didn't actually realise that living in a house that was filled with people talking about nothing but birds and having birds all around us and, and uh, my only pet for instance was a duck um, and this all you know seemed perfectly natural to, to me um, mm. and I think the real thing is that although like most young people I tried very hard to do something else um, the, the, the amount I actually learned by simply being there with all this going on. Mm. I mean, for instance, my, my pet duck, which uh, um, uh, which I, I like very much, uh, very fond of, um, he got sh killed on the road outside. So my father, uh, being an ornithologist, uh, just presented me with another duck. Um, and at the age of about six or something, I looked at this duck and said, that's not my duck. <laughs> so I was already getting into the fact that you could actually tell individuals one yeah. from the other at that sort of age. So although um, I went on to do other things, I did actually um, start off like that. So I guess the, the biggest influence in my life as far as natural history is concerned was my father. And I think this is so of a lot of uh, ornithologists and, and, and naturalists that they, they actually pick it up from their father whether they take it on or not it's a matter for them but they they do actually often get their foundations there so that, yes. that's where I start basically <laughs> <laughs> and so and, and it's it's ornithology isn't it that's your area of expertise and and, and, and you've continued that through so, so so obviously with early experiences with ducks but but how, how has that developed since? Do you have kind of particular areas of interest within ornithology that you've developed over that time? Well, I, I think that the two things that, uh, I mean, the first thing is that, uh, as I said, I, I went off and did other things. Um, and then, but my father um, was sort of fairly in, advanced in the things he was doing. I mean, he was taking expeditions to different places with his students from Newcastle, um, adult education uh, to do studies on daily behavior of birds, uh, mm. including Arctic studies and things like this. Um, and although I, I wasn't living at home anymore, um, I was in my early 20s, uh, he, he rang me up and, and, and said that he was taking an expedition to Africa and um, he needed a driver and photographer for the expedition. Well, obviously, he taught me, he was also a photographer and he taught me how to, you know photography uh, at an early age as well. Um, so um, I, I wasn't doing anything particular at the time, so I said, yes, okay, um, when, you know, when are we going? And uh, so we set off for uh, what, what was one of the earliest uh, tourist um, planes taking tourists to Africa. I mean, when you were very rich, you could fly to Africa and go out on safari and so on like that but the, the actual ordinary public type people didn't do that and this was one of the first flights and it, it went from frankfurt to uh, nairobi and what year was that david roughly uh oh it was uh, 1969 which has been heralded in a song somewhere uh but um uh it it, it was um 
what he was wanting to do is he'd done a lot of studies on birds uh, on the effect of uh, total day lengths on them in the Arctic. Right. And what he was wanting to do was to study the, the effect of uh, equatorial forest and equatorial conditions on the day length of birds. Mm -hmm. So that was the, the object. Um, and so we, we set off and, and this plane had, uh, it was a two propeller job uh, and it flew 10,000 feet uh, oh. and across the, 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 the deserts and things. And wow. it, it ended up having to refuel at Khartoum. Um, and, and I don't know whether it was the main exported Khartoum, but it consisted of a, a runway, not very long, and uh, a little wooden hut and a hand done petrol pump that they poured the petrol into the aeroplane. Um, and eventually they managed to fill it. And we, we, we were surrounded by four guards with uh, bandellas of bullets across and machine guns, yeah. um, which was all exciting in the middle of the night. Uh, and then we set off again. And as we came down off the, uh, the, the highlands of Ethiopia, um, we, we dropped down because we were staying 10,000 feet to so drop down. And we hit a, a major tropical storm. Yeah. And uh, the, the plane um, dropped like a lift for about probably 5,000 feet um, and it, it, it just stopped coming down when it had gone below the cloud so we were actually almost nearly on the ground and when I looked out it, uh, my first views of East Africa were uh, a place that looked like Hades because uh, the, the lightning had set fires all over the desert you know that stuff was burning and the whole thing looked like a burning inf inferno down there and I thought, wow, this is quite a place. Um, and, uh, I think I'd have been thinking, oh no. <laughs> well, it, yeah. again, you know, this is the father thing. My father, who uh, never learned to drive and never uh, learned any sort of method of transport apart from public, um, he, um, I looked at him sitting in the seat next to me, uh, you know, as we were hurtling straight down towards the ground, and he was totally calm and completely un moved and I learned something then that the main thing is if you're leading a party you just always look totally calm and relaxed and you don't look like there's anything going wrong at all mm. and I've used that technique quite a lot over the years yeah. um, but anyway we got to Nairobi and um, I just fell absolutely in love with Africa and with the animals and the birds and everything mm. and I had my moment of epitome in Africa when I was trying to photograph a leopard, that, sorry, a cheetah that was coming towards me and was moving straight along in a line towards me. Mm -hmm. And I'd leaned right out of the car. We didn't have health and safety in those days. Uh, and I leaned right out of the car and I was, I was sort of probably waist, you know, my waist was sticking through the window. And so I was fairly well visible. And I was looking through my telephoto lens and this animal looked straight back at me, straight up the lens. And the thoughts that I think it had was, should I try or should I not try to take him out of that car? Yeah, and, and that was it. I just couldn't, the excitement, the adrenaline was just so great. All I wanted to do was meet another yeah. cat or something like that and enjoy the same thing. And uh, so I spent the next 20 years taking people to Africa. Wow. Um, and uh, going once or twice a year. So that's how I started. Amazing. I mean, I had all the background. You know, I could automatically, you know, I'd learned identification of birds and how to do it and everything. But this was when I said, right, this is what I want to do. And I retired from my job and just um, became a, a freelance naturalist. Amazing. And so, uh, you know, obviously traveling the world, um, doing that work um, and but did you also when you were at home as it were were you, were you kind of exploring the local environment as well and wildlife and, and photography as well? Well I, I mean um, I ended up you know obviously um, I, I started working for adult education in, in Newcastle University and uh, I, I worked for other educational things and my main thing was actually teaching people about birds um, that's where my skill, if there is any, uh, lies. Um, and and um, 
that was also where one could make a living. I, I had no problem with this. I actually really enjoy lecturing. Uh, I don't know whether people enjoy listening, but I certainly enjoy doing it. So, um, and, and I mean, you know, I've, I've lectured for groups of sort of three up to uh, hundreds, um, and, and they all give you a different sort of thrill. And I'm sure you would, you'd you know that lecturing can be a really um, enthralling and interesting thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and so really I, I found that that was actually what I liked most about ornithology, mm -hmm. trying to share my passion for, for birds and animals with people who were interested. Mm -hmm. and, and I've done that for 51 years. I actually added it up before I came here just to see how long it was. And it was a bit shocking that it was 51 years. Uh, but, or, um, you know, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the real thing that is amazing is I can still be enthusiastic after 51 well, years of teaching the same stuff, which uh, I do find this I mean, surprising. I mean, on that, David, you know, 50, 51 years, I mean, have you noticed any change in the public appetite or public attitudes towards the natural world over that period of time? Well, I think a great uh, deal of change has happened. I mean, I think the, the, the modern, um, all the television stuff, and the, all the wildlife stuff has had a major impact on people's sort of perception of the world. And, and uh, this event things made you know, the sort of thing I do easier in, in the sense that, that people have a much bigger understanding. You still meet people who have absolutely no idea whatsoever, uh, but most of the, the, the public now have actually got a, a fairly good idea about what's happening in natural history and so on. And, and so are, are much more... Um, not laughing at you so much. I mean, in the, you know, the, the early days, going around with a pair of binoculars was considered to be stupid and <laughs> funny and 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 and, and um, people used to sort of stand and stare at you and and and, and think i mean it never bothered me because I've, I've done it since i was a child but it it, it, it uh, um i i did have one case where where i was running a course uh, we Angus Lunn and I used to run courses uh, on, on uh, the natural history of the Lake District and the natural history of uh, Northumberland mm. for adult education. But I also used to run bird courses the same. And when I was running one for uh, uh, the birds of uh, Cumbria, um, I had a lady on that um, who I, I couldn't, I, I think it was just a sense of humour, but uh, when we were at uh, uh, one of the cliff areas in, 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 in the Lake District, looking, looking down on, on seabirds and things. Um, she, she didn't get down and lie down with us. She stood on the other side of the path and um, said, um, those are bird watchers and I'm not with them. <laughs> So that was a, an interesting sidelight on, on, on some people's opinion. So, yeah, that it was a, like an odd hobby almost rather than... Yeah, yeah yes. That, 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 yes. So, so, but, um, I mean, overall, I, I think that um, the changes that have taken place have been for the good in the sense that the general public now is very much more aware of things. And, of course, with what we have been doing to the planet uh, during my lifetime uh, uh, and perhaps previous generations, I guess, um, it, it is really very serious. And we are now beginning to sort of get a, a bit of a grip on, on the general opinion that we may have to do something about it. I mean, the politicians even are starting to even look that way, which is something, I guess. So yes. um, that, that's a very important step. Yeah, I mean, I was, I was going to ask that question, actually, which was, you know, obviously, you know, going to um, Africa in, in, in the late 1960s and, um, and, and all around the world, um, or even, even locally here in, in Northumberland is, is, is has have you seen a you know a, a degradation in the in the natural world in the environment over that time or um i i think that there's two different things going on basically the 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 climate change i the the 
potential warming of the climate uh, is, is one thing that, that uh, globally is actually altering habitats quite, quite markedly. Um, but more locally, uh, our continual uh, building uh, uh, at the rates we are of, of properties and things like this. I mean, th this is, is changing, reducing our environment very greatly. It's one of the reasons why we're so lucky in the Fundland that we've actually uh, got such an active um, wildlife trust. I mean, Angus Lund, who I think you've interviewed, he, he uh, was one of the founder members of the trust uh, and, and, and uh, tremendously active in it, its, um, its work. Uh, and and uh, it, it has been a real saviour of, of vast areas of our county. I mean, if you, when I used to go up and down the coast in the early days, um, none of those reserves that are there now were there. Um, there was subsidence ponds, but they were just ponds, uh, the, the, you know, fields that had gone underwater basically because <laughs> of the mining. Uh, but now they are reserves and being looked after. Um, you know, you, you hear comments about the, the water level should have been better this year, there, and so But I mean, in fact, with the fact we've got those areas and, and uh, the changes in the numbers of birds and things that have mm -hmm. come into them is very great. So we're pretty lucky. Um, yeah. Other parts of the country are a lot less well off uh, with, with uh, having as much area. Uh, and it makes it really great to to live in a county where I can still go out and, and walk in, in pretty peaceful places yes. um, where there's birds and animals that are still um, living a reasonably normal life. Yes. So. And it's interesting you say, you know, that that's, a lot of that is down to the pioneering work of societies um, and, and trusts, you know, and, yes. and, and active, you know, far-sighted individuals. And so... Yes. So I wonder um, when and why you first got involved with the society. Um, well, it, 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 I'd been involved with the society since an early age, not necessarily as a member. But my father was a very uh, keen uh, member of the society, and uh, he uh, ran courses um, where he, he uh, booked the society. By the way, you may or may not know, but during the uh, 1950s, uh, it ran uh, the uh, watchtower on the farms, on the inner farm, as a study centre. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, Grace Hickley, my, my uh, predecessor in the job as secretary, uh, she, she uh, organised this. And my father was one of the uh, keen people to take this up. Mm -hmm. uh, and he used to take his students out to the farms uh, these were adult students. I mean, we're, we're not talking sort of um, university students. Right. We're talking about adult education. Uh, and they used to, we used to stay on there. And I mean, I first lived out on the farm when I was five years old. Um, I don't remember it, but uh, um, I, I was there. My mother was there as well, which was useful. She probably saved me from drowning. Um, <laughs> but um, it was uh, so, uh, it was interesting because fairly recently uh, I hadn't, been when the trust sort of uh, in the, the 70s started making the farms uh, more uh, well they weren't making a tourist thing they were trying to protect the birds from the tourists yes uh, and so they had to uh, regulate the farms before that wasn't there wasn't regulation we could just go out and do yeah. things you know oh, um, but um, uh, once that happened uh, the, the tower and everything were, were, were no longer available to us uh, to go out or, or see and and i do remember more recently uh, when we've been doing work on the farms with ringing um the i went into the tower and and i thought how small all the windows were and i realized that i was thinking them as as a child but i remember them these, these great windows but actually they were quite small in in, in there so uh, <laughs> yes so i'd grown up yes exactly yes that's, that's it. yeah yeah. I forgot what the question was. So um, it, was, it was just when you were first getting involved with the society. And obviously, as you say, you became the secretary uh, yes, for many right. years as well. Yes, well, it, it, it was um, um, <laughs> the, the becoming 
the, the secretary of the society was uh, wasn't something I wasn't particularly interested in at the time because actually I was doing pretty well as a freelance and I had a fairly um, exciting life. I mean, I was spending up to four months traveling the world, uh, seeing most of the birds and things that I was very interested in. Mm -hmm. I also was taking people sailing and bird watching. Uh, um, um, you know, qualified skipper for, for yachts, and we were sailing the Caribbean and the Mediterranean and also ah. west of Scotland. Um, so, you know, I, I, I had a fairly um, exciting time most of the time, um, but um, I did realise I was getting older and I did need to actually think about what I was doing. I was enjoying myself rather, and I wasn't actually achieving very much in the the real world, if you follow me, you know, I mean, yeah. where things actually happen and things get yeah. done. Yeah. So um, it was an opportunity. And and um, I mean, I've been, as I say, involved with the society and uh, I had uh, known Grey Sickling uh, uh, slightly. I, I certainly wasn't involved very much in it because we did live in North Northumberland and, and it wasn't, it really, you know, you couldn't go to the meetings or anything, really. In any way, uh, both Father and I were lecturing five nights a week, so so we didn't really have much chance to, to do anything um, mm -hmm. other than that. Um, but uh, my wife actually saw the, the advert for the job, because I was away with Angus Lunn on a course, uh, and um, she sent for the application because it said secretary, to the Natural History Society, and she was a secretary, if you follow me. Um, and, and she said, oh, this would be an interesting job in natural history, being in the, in the office of the mm. society. But when she got the application, she realized it was for the secretary as opposed to a secretary. Um, and um, so she, you know, we obviously communicated uh, on the phone, and she said, I think I've got a job for you. Um, <laughs> Uh, and I said, ah, yes, well, yes, okay. okay. Um, <laughs> and she said, uh, um, so she filled the application form out for me. Um, and then uh, she, she posted it to me to sign and, and send off. Brilliant. And, and so when I read it, I you know, was ready to see, but I want to do this. But I thought, yeah, well, you know, I should really have a look at this and see whether this is something I could actually start doing mm -hmm. a little bit of good with, perhaps. Um, so, <laughs> basically, it's cut a short look. So I, I saw at the bottom that it needed two referees, you see, and I thought, oh, well, obviously, one of the people I should really try and get a ref reference from is Angus Lunn, who was on the course. Mm -hmm. And so I, uh, I, I saw Angus, we were in the bar in the evening after we'd been lecturing, and, and I said, oh, Angus, I, I'm, I'm applying for the secretary's job at the society. Uh, would you give me a reference, you see? And he says, oh, no. Um, so, well, you know, he says, I can't, I'm on the um, committee that's uh, actually interviewing the, the applicants. So I thought, well, that could be good or bad, but we'll see. Anyway, I found a couple of people that would really need to sign up that I was honest, which was one of the things that was really a problem because the secretary of the society was one of the key holders for the Hancock because we owned the Hancock Museum. Yes. The society, uh, the representative, as it were, um, uh, is actually one of the key holders. So you have complete access night and day to uh, all the collections and everything in the museum, which, of course, is a, a major financial thing. Yeah. Um, and and uh, also from the society's point, you had access to their library, which at the time wasn't particularly available to the members. Anyway, that was one of my first things that I, I set out to do was to make the library available. Um, um, I succeeded, but um, it wasn't it wasn't an easy passage because they were very worried about people stealing books, which I thought really was not really having books that people can't read is not actually much. Sorry, use. yes, it yeah. Is. And I also hear that you you were the person who introduced computers. <laughs> yes, oh yes, all oh, the excitement. I had no idea till later on how, how sort of um, close to the beginning of everything we were. 
Um, and and uh, I mean, they, as I say, the, the little green screens, and then we had one that had black print and white backgrounds. Wow, that was oh. exciting. Um, and and uh, we used uh, a thing called Word Perfect. Um, Word, Word was no good. It didn't need to work at all at that time. Um, but um, Word Perfect worked pretty well. It had, and, and, and we were in the process of producing the flora of Northumberland. Right. And this was the reason why I got the finance to introduce computers. Computers were terribly expensive compared with typewriters. Uh, and so you consequently, uh, you had to really uh, justify why you wanted something that seemed to do exactly the same job. Yeah. Um, I mean, it didn't. I mean, you know, we all know that, that, that the fact that you can write something and then correct it easily and, and you know, hone it in a way that's totally different. Yes. And I realised that um, the production of the floor of Northumberland wasn't going to take place unless I could speed up the way in which all... You see, um, Professor Swan, who was the author, uh, was a, a brilliant botanist. As, you know, I mean, he really was. He was a brilliant chemist as well. Um, but he, he was sort of adamant that his book had to be absolutely up to date. So every year he went out and checked all the where the flora was in the Thumbland and came back and redid all his maps and then wanted the notes all redone again. And uh, they were being typed every time. So the, the thing was being retyped year after year. Well, you know, it was, what, it was 700 pages uh, in, in print. Yeah. Uh, so you can imagine the amount of typing that had to go on just to keep this up to date. So I realised we had to go into computing. And so Margaret Patterson, who was uh, um, sort of, well, she, she'd run the society for a year between Grace Hickling dying and me coming to the society. Mm -hmm. I couldn't actually, I had so many commitments, I couldn't actually uh, take the job up for six months after I'd got it. So, um, although I went into the office and was working voluntarily to, to try and get, you know, keep things going. Um, but uh, so we, we set about learning computing uh, and uh, we, we uh, did. I couldn't type, of course, because I was used to having people type for me. Uh, so um, I, I, I had to learn. I, I've never learned to type properly, but uh, I, I, you know, obviously, like all of us, we can now hit the keyboard fairly, fairly well. Um, but um, so we set about doing that. Uh, and then we began to realize that the cost of this book was going to be extremely high. Uh, we were talking about at the time probably about 40 or 50,000 pounds for the production. Um, that, at that time in the early 90s, that was a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, and so at that point, um, the, the, the printing was all linotronic. That was, you, you put your, your, your typewritten stuff in uh -huh. with the uh, codes that the, the typing machine would use. Uh, and you wrote the codes in to the text and then the linotronic machine would turn it into sheets which could be photographed to, to print. And that was the process. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, it, it, it looked like it, the problem was that we wanted the maps in the text. Oh. And this was going to make it very complicated. So we, we decided we needed uh, uh, to go into desktop publishing. So we had to actually learn desktop publishing at the very beginning of when it was taking when place. Was um, and and um, Trisha Hammack, who, who was a volunteer, uh, she's gone on to become a doctor at the Durham University now, um, but she had young children at the time, so she was unable to, 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 to you know, follow her, her academic career. Mm. And she, she really pulled it together. Um, I mean, I worked with her obviously on it, but, but uh, and with Margaret doing the typing, because she was a really fast typist. Between, between the three of us, we managed to put the thing very much together. I mean, we had a committee that did all the scientific stuff, but we were actually sort of building it up. And uh, Tricia managed to make the, the, the macros that would put the map spaces in properly so that it would be exactly the right size for the thumbnail. The thumbnail is a terrible shape, by the way. You try fitting it into, into text. Um, yes. Yeah. 
And the other restriction we had was Professor Swan refused to have the order of the species different from the, the standard order, which I can understand. It's a perfectly logical thing. But that meant trying to fit maps into pages uh, was, was great fun. So we had to learn this. And then at the very end, I got a, a, the first scanner, which uh -huh. cost an enormous amount of money, wow. and set about scanning the 500 document, uh, maps in. Uh -huh. And I put one in, and the computer said, there's no memory left. <laughs> that only left me 499 to, to not it. know what to do with. Uh, it had used the entire memory of the computer of putting one single map in. And that wasn't even at very good quality. So I had to have the maps uh, done in ordinary printing form. And then I stuck them all on by hand onto the final linotronic sheets that came out. Um, I oh, still yeah. have the aches in my arm from doing, doing this, this work. That's, that is astonishing now, isn't it, to think? I mean, obviously yes. you're at just the forefront of that technological innovation, whether it's photography or yes. publishing or... And now we're we're having a talk on Zoom virtually. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, <laughs> yes. Uh, it's just totally and unbelievable. By email and, you know... Yes. It's, it's, Make, yeah. Incredible. It makes me feel a bit old. This. <laughs> <laughs> I think it makes us feel all a bit old. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> well, um, well, thank you so much uh, indeed for for talking to me today. And, and ref I mean, I think I think we need to have a part two for this interview, frankly, because <laughs> I think there's a bit more. Yes, we there's haven't really got going yet. I know, um, but but just to get that that sense of. I suppose the scale and pace of that change and that you were part of and the society was part of and and I suppose all of us in in the environment as well it's yes, just been yes. it's just been incredible I mean for you what has there is there one kind of highlight or one thing that really stands out for you over that 51 years or um I I, I think really the, the thing that that um, well, the two things that uh, I think that I managed to do is, is one is, is is to encourage an awful lot of people through my lectures to to uh, take up natural history. Quite a lot of them have become uh, really useful members of the naturalist community, doing uh, as at working people. Um, and the other is, I think, probably the work I managed to do in Gosford Park, which we, we haven't got to, um, in in creating, um, you know, increasing the reed beds by over a hundred percent in the in the twenty years, and therefore increasing the the value of the reserve uh, because the reed beds were one of the things that made it a site of special scientific interest. So I, I reckon those were the the two things that possibly of some use, uh, which is why I joined the society in the first place. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, th I think you're being too modest there. I think they're, you know, ab among many achievements, but, but as you say, you know, encouraging the next generations, um, but also in a sense, you, you know, that kind of commitment and, and, and into the reserve itself. And, and and you know expanding its importance and 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 the possibilities there is just incredible. Yes. But, <laughs> well, <watching>. uh, <laughs> well, I I think that uh, you know uh, I left it where uh, James who took over from me as the um, the first director. Uh, he he um, uh, had a reserve that was physically ready for the next stage that is to to try to uh, be able to get grants and things and he did manage to get the proper lease that we required uh, to do that i spent i spent my 20 years trying to get the lease but failed miserably to do so i twice even announced it in the bulletin that we got it and then was told we hadn't got it uh, uh, so i have a, a bad record for that but um the uh, but he got it sorted and and that's meant that of course he and and um, uh, Claire have been able to actually get grants, and, and this has done a lot towards helping improve the membership uh, and also improve the reserve from the, the members and, and the public's point of view. So it, it, it's moving on and, and becoming an even better place than it, than it was. But it needed that, those, you know, 20 years, decades of groundwork from 
you know, well, they, they, they desilt, because we desilted the entire lake. I mean, I, I, I got grants for that because that was sort of SSSI type work and uh, Natural England and all of its various forms uh, was able to um, uh, uh, give grants to me for that yeah. without uh, there being a problem with the fact that I only had six months shooting rights for the reserve. That was the lease that we had. So, so um, you know, it, it, it was serious stuff in the sense that I couldn't get hold of all the grants that were available. Yeah. But um, they did allow us to do, do that type of work and, and, and that has set the reserve up for at least probably, I reckon, 30 odd years before we'll have to do any more major sort of uh, work on the actual um, vegetation, as it were. Of the reserve. Yeah. We are doing work on the trees, but that's a different thing. You know? Yes, but, but as you say, yes, um, well, that's, that's amazing. Thank you so much for talking to me. Today, David, it's been fascinating, and I know the viewers will think so too. Um, so thank you again. Well, no problem, no. Quite enjoyed myself. It's yes. nice to talk to someone in these days when you hardly meet anyone at all. Exactly. <laughs> well, thank you so much. Okay. Thanks. Um, Bye. No, no, well, let me, um, I'll just... Um, okay.